Hi everyone and welcome to Lit Film Fest Classrooms, where we write together to make cool stuff. I'm Tim and today we're joined with Sai. Hi. Or not Sai. Hi. And Tom Huddleston. Hello. And Tom, you're an author of futuristic writing, aren't you? That's correct. Yeah, I'm the author of uh, Flood Worlds and Dust Road, which are newly out and Look how shiny they are. Very oh, so shiny. Shiny new. I know, it's, it's, it's oh. ridiculous. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. They're like the shiny on the inside of like like uh, those sticker packs you used to get yeah. in, when we were in school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know they're good books. It's a rare. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Today the challenge will be to write our own futuristic cities and it's great that we have you here to, today, to, um, Tom, because you're going to be telling us about how you wrote um, Flood Worlds um, and, and we'll be looking a bit about that, that wonderful futuristic dystopian future to get some ideas from, from what you've done. Cool. Um, just, just tell us a little bit about, about the book, um, just so that we know. Sure. About, about so, so Flood World is the first book and Dust Road is the sequel and uh, their adventure stories set uh, far in the future, as, as you said, in, in a, a futuristic flooded version of, of, of London. And they're about uh, a pair of street kids called Cara and Joe who stumble upon a secret map and end up getting into all kinds of conflict and end up in, mixed up in these huge events and battles and invasions and explosions and chases and all kinds of stuff. It sounds um, great. <laughs> you've, sold, you've sold it to me. I want to yeah, read it. They're full of action and, and weird characters and funny bits and weird future technology. And someone said um, that it was like a blockbuster movie and a book. And that was kind of, oh, that's the intention of kind of a big, great big adventure. Great. Yeah. What, what, what made you want to write about the future and, and what happens in it? Well, I mean, the books take place in, in the city where I live, but in, the, in, in this future that's very different from today. And uh, the climate has obviously changed a lot. People like, you know, Greta Thunberg and all those wonderful climate strikers have been ignored. And uh, the world's got warmer and the seas have risen. And, um, you know, things are very, very different. The world, large parts of the world have been flooded. And I wanted to write the book partly because um, I think that climate change is a very serious issue and we all need to be really aware of it. But I wanted to make readers aware of it in a way that would be enjoyable to experience. Mm. But and, and at the same time, I just love, even though I don't want my city to be flooded, I love the image of a flooded city. I love this idea of, you know, streets full of water and half sunk buildings and, and boats instead of cars. And, you know, it, it's just a really exciting, immediately exciting image to me. So it's kind of all that stuff coming together. It feels a bit like Venice, like the way you yes. can like just keep yeah. keep building higher, isn't it? Um, it's all right. We can manage. We don't. We can be flooded, <laughs> and it's absolutely. We just go higher, guys. It's fine. I've no got problem. I've got uh, an aunt, an uncle who live in Venice actually, so I've I've, I've been there quite a few times. Right. Um, right. That makes me sound really uh, posh and fancy. But, uh, <laughs> uh, my uncle was, was a was a communist brain surgeon, um, and he, but they have a. Uh, that's mine's that's another book. <laughs> 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 they have a they, they live in venice so i get to go there a lot and, and it, it really informs the book like um because wow. one of the great things about being in venice is that it, it, it even though it's a really weird setup it's become normal so you see mm. hospital you know ambulance boats and rubbish boats full of piled mm. with you know uh, garbage uh so it's just it, it's, it's the way that that really weird way of living has become totally normal to them. I find that really, really fascinating. Shall we have a look at um, a section of the book? Yeah. And, and then we'll, we can see how you've written it. There we go. So we've got, a, we've got an extract on, on the screen of something that Tom has written for Flood World. Um, and we'll, we'll pick this apart and think about why it describes the future so, so I was going to say nicely, but actually it's... Uh, <laughs> unnicely <laughs> Un unnicely <laughs> that's right dramatically yeah that's it so tom would you mind reading this out for us yeah absolutely car across to the window looking down into the watery streets the sun brushed the horizon and light slanted between the crumbling concrete towers dappling the water with streaks of gold the air was hazy with smoke from countless cup fires and Kara heard snatches of laughter, shouts of anger, and the cries of children. She wondered what must be going on down there, 
cops and cooks going about their business, mothers feeding their kids and knowing there wasn't enough left to feed themselves, boys no bigger than Joe running errands for gangsters and thieves. Yes, it was a rough place, but when she thought about leaving, Cara felt a pang of doubt. This was the only home she'd ever known. There was hardship and there was cruelty, of course there was, but there was decency too, an opportunity. You had to be tough to survive in the shanties, and she was. I really like how it uh, tells you a lot about Cara whilst describing the, the, the setting that she's in. So even though it's focused on really sort of uh, describing this this futuristic city with the watery streets and you, the light um, sort of coming down between these you know old concrete towers, it's actually telling you a lot about Cara's response to those things and her and how she feels yeah. being in that surrounding. Yeah, I mean it's very much uh, she's grown up in this place and I and I think that you know however. It goes back to what we were just saying about Venice to a, to a certain extent, but however weird and intense and extreme the place you grew up in, it's still the place you grew up. And so mm. you know it and it's familiar to you and it's comfortable to you, even if it's, you know, crazy and it would seem crazy and weird to someone else. It's your home. Mm. Yeah. So when, when writing, Tom, what, how do you use sentences and words to affect, to, to give the audience, the readers, an idea of the future? What goes through your mind? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I, I, my, my main uh, drive when writing um, about a, a world that doesn't exist currently is <laughs> to imagine it as clearly as possible. And I mm. feel like if I can imagine it as clearly as possible, and if I know it inside out, then um, the reader will will get the same impression. So I, I, I can say, you know, one useful thing to know might be that the first draft of Flood World, or the earlier drafts of Flood World, quite a few of them, were much longer than this one. So I wrote much, much more about this future world than actually mm -hmm. ended up in the book. Right. So I described it in much more detail but you don't necessarily need all that detail um you can get away with less but as long as you know it really clearly then the reader will be able to see it and that detail almost comes through by osmosis or in, in a weird sort of way it ends up on the page even though the, the specific words aren't there and you, you can see elements of, of of that the way you have described the, the, the scene in quite a few different ways, like, um, you know, the crumbling concrete towers definitely stand out, out to me. It's what she sees, but also what she hears. She hears the, the, the shouts of anger and the cries of children. Also, you know, I can imagine that smelling countless cook fires as well as seeing it. So yeah. even though you, you, can, you can feel there's, there's a whole weight of writing behind all of these descriptions, but you're walking yeah. with Cara as she goes through the, the setting as well. Yeah, I, I want I want the reader to feel like they're really in there with the characters, and that again comes back to what you were saying about how the characters are feeling and what they're thinking. Mm. Um, it's it's all related, so um, it's not just about you know she walked through uh, you know between some towers. It's about mm. her walking through between the towers and it feeling a particular way to her and it sparking ideas in her mind or feelings in her. Um, yeah, so it's all related and it all tangles mm. together. Yeah. I think one of the things that I really enjoy when I'm reading is um, is being able to see the that setting through in the way that the author wants me to see it. And so yeah. sort of mm. having a, um, a very clear description um, it is great and I also love it when you get illustrations of, of yeah. because I know that that's kind of been vetted by the author um, they've kind of um, they've kind of that's been poured all of their their thoughts have been poured into that illustration to, to be able to help me visualize what what's going on in that world um, and yeah. I think we've got some uh, a map that's uh, that's from yeah. your book haven't we uh, so I didn't, uh, I didn't draw this version of the map. Uh, mm. I am nowhere near that. You do that a different narrative. version. <laughs> uh, I drew, yes, a very, <laughs> very different <laughs> version, which looks like it was 
drawn by a four-year-old in crayon by comparison. And this version was drawn. <laughs> this version was drawn by an enormously talented uh, illustrator called Jensen Aqua, who did who did the illustrations for throughout the book and in Dutch Road as well. It's great. So you can kind of see from the map. Um, it's, it's the city of London, but obviously it's very different from flooded. Um, but then this huge wall has been built around the centre of the city to keep, you, know, you can see on the other houses of Parliament, mm. uh, and then, you know, later uh, Bank of England and the you know, place, places like that to keep them dry and to keep the uh, wealthy, powerful and important people inside mm. safe. Mm. But the people who built the wall made one key mistake, which was they forgot to leave enough space inside the wall for all the people who actually keep the city running. So <laughs> mm. medics, cleaners, shop staff, key workers, essentially, as I think is the right. Key yeah. workers, yeah. <laughs> um, and so outside the wall, um, in the top floors of tower blocks, which have been, you know, flooded halfway up and on rafts and walkways linking them together, this second city has, has kind of sprung up almost by itself um, and it's called the shanties and it's basically a huge sort of floating slum and that's where Kara and Joe um, are introduced to us and it's sort of a busy hectic and dangerous place but it's kind of exciting as well and, and, and uh, as, as we saw from the extract it's, it's, it's where Kara's lived all her life and it's a place that she loves. Mm. Yeah really like that um that feel of just the city, like you said, you, you've, drawn a, you've drawn a huge map so that you know how to write about it then as well. Yeah, absolutely, really helps me visualize it. And just seeing that divide between like the rich and the poor, or you know, the people in high society, it feels a little bit, in dystopian novels, they often explore that theme anyway. Like, you know, yeah. say for example, The Hunger Games does that in great depth, doesn't it? You know, the, the rich and the powerful are in control and they've split everyone apart. And, you know, having that drawn out really emphasizes that in, in, in your novels, really. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that you bring up The Hunger Games because Suzanne Collins does something in The Hunger Games that I also did in Flood World, which is to go back to the past to find inspiration for the future. So in the Hunger mm. Games, she uses kind of Roman inspirations, Roman influences, ideas of the Colosseum and the games. I mean, her future is called Panem, which means it's Latin for bread. Um, mm. And my future, I took inspiration from kind of Dickens and Victorian London, the kind of slums of Victorian London, to create this kind of hectic future slum. So, um, I mean, I think that's a really, if you're writing, stories set in the future or if you're inventing worlds set in the future um it's really fun and interesting to go back to the past um i think because humanity has this habit of making similar mistakes over and over again or yeah. you know yeah. creating yeah. similar problems over and over again so it's it's mm. uh, you're thinking about writing a story set in the future then the past or at least the present are good places to start, I think. And I suppose we'll, we'll think about the activity that everyone can do at home now, but that, but that right. leads in quite nicely to that because it's not just about designing your own city, it's designing a culture, isn't it? You know, what Absolutely. Yeah. is the fashion mm. like in the future? What's the city like? What, what's the food yeah. like? Because you know, mm. how are you going to get food to like your flooded city if, yeah. you, if you've done exactly. that? Exactly. And, and yeah. for me, this is, this is the fun bit of writing you know, I mean I mean I love you know there's so much about writing that I love because otherwise I wouldn't be doing it but probably top of the list is world building essentially so as you say invent imagining a place that doesn't exist and then imagining the people who live there and how they live what they do for a living and what they eat and what mm. they wear and how they get from place to place do they have TV? Do they have any kind of entertainment? Or do they have any contact with the outside world? Who's in charge? Do they uh, run things well? Do they run things badly? And then as you're saying, you widen it out and then where does the food come from? Mm. Where do the clothes come from? Do people make the clothes themselves? Uh, mm. it's just to me, this is, this is yeah. really, really fun stuff. Is there, is there YouTube in your future, Tom? Uh, there is kind of, yes, there is, oh, um, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. all the kids are home. Oh, thank goodness. Yeah. They, they, they <laughs> refer to kind of news feeds, which, um, <laughs> essentially is, I think a kind of futuristic <laughs> YouTube thing. Interesting. Yes. It's the only way that people outside the world can get any kind of idea of what's happening 
yeah. uh, in the city or in the world at large, really. Great. Well, on to that. Um, your challenge for today is to create your own futuristic city, kids. Uh, we'd like you to draw uh, where you live in the future. So look out, look outside. You might not be able to go outside, but you can look outside on your windows. Imagine what is the major thing that has changed about outside. You can draw ideas from Tom's um, city um, in flood worlds, if you would like. And um, just imagine all flood, but what other things could have happened? Uh, we'd like you to then write a short description about your futuristic city, you know, walk through it, use some of those techniques we talked about with Tom. What can you see? What can you smell? Imagine walking the reader through that. Um, and also, how does it make your character or you think or feel? And then send them in to us at info at litfilmfest.com. You can email us or you can tweet us at litfilmfest. Also, how do we, how do we get in contact with you, Tom? Uh, you can get in contact with me on Twitter at... Uh, Tom Huddleston underscore. Um, that's probably the best way. I've also got a website, www.tomhuddleston.co.uk. I don't have it, I think. <laughs> I've suddenly <laughs> forgot my own, my own web address. I'm pretty sure that's what it is. I mean, just search me on Google and I'll come up. Great. We'll put um, it, we'll put it yeah, below I'm, as well in the link. Yeah. I'm really, really keen to, uh, to see these invented cities as well. Oh, and, you know, I should say, if you don't live in a city, um, Towns will change in the future too, as will, you know, if you live in a remote farmhouse in the middle of nowhere, um, that would also change dramatically in the future. You yeah. could end up living in the middle of the city if the city nearest to you spreads and spreads and spreads. Mm. Yeah, what would it be like in your farmhouse to have a, a huge high rise block of flats next to you? Exactly. Or, or what kind of yeah. things would you have to grow as a farmer in the future as well? So there's, there's lots of avenues to explore, isn't there? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Tom, for joining us today. Thank you very, very much for uh, asking me to come on. It's been really good fun. Yeah, really Tom, nice pleasure. to meet you, Tom. Thank you, for, uh, thank you for providing such inspirational uh, uh, text and, and images and things so that we can do our own writing. Thanks very much. Yeah, great. We'll, we'll join tribes in the future when society collapses. That'd be lovely. I, yeah. I am in. <laughs> <laughs> okay, take care, Tom. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.